Afternoon everyone. My name is John Richards and I'm going to present some stuff uh, digitally and I've also brought along a table of objects that I will also uh, talk about and to use a term that Tim brought up, you know, let the objects speak for themselves. I may switch a little bit between the two. I'm going to start off uh, at a tangent. Listening to Lisa's uh, talk made me think of a particular idiosyncrasy of this room. And in many ways, it uh, sums up my approach to making sound and music. I quickly composed a piece for PowerPoint. You may have noticed the, the very nice Let's have a look at this. Very nice hum. So the beautiful difference between a black screen and a white screen is music to my ears. Partly because of the way in which this lovely cable is configured, where the audio cable is married next to the video cable. All of a sudden, I'm in the world of performance art here. Perhaps I can... Oh, that's interesting. That doesn't, that doesn't do it. Yeah, anyway, a slight tangent. But these details of materials and the way they influence my art or music is, is, is something that I'm fascinated with. I'm probably best known for my work as something called Dirty Electronics. I studied music. I say to my friends, I was radicalised at Dartington College of Arts. I then went on to do what I thought was music composition. Although, once having a PhD in composition, I uh, turned my back on this idea of composer. I also turned my back on spending hours and hours peering in f into my computer. Uh, to begin with, when I started making music with digital technology, it was fascinating. It was incredibly difficult. As a postgraduate at the University of York, uh, there was only one computer where we could actually process audio. And the only way in which you could save your work was to put it in a temporary, uh, on a temporary disc, which was erased each night. Uh, by the university and the way to stop that would be to stay up at th until three in the morning so that if you were logged in your work wouldn't get erased. Of course there were many nights where you just didn't wake up and all your work got erased and then one of my uh, clever um, students wrote some kind of script that would automatically log you in and the university weren't too pleased about this either because it brought the whole university system down, to, crashing down. Anyway, I very much enjoyed making a, a music through tactile approaches, using my hands. Uh, I learned instruments, I suppose, through a tactile approach. Learning the guitar or something like the piano was all about shapes and patterns. And uh, this, this particularly was something I was, I was, I kind of missed ha having spent a lot of time just using a, a keyboard at the time. I was also interested in the type of material of sound uh, and the types of material uh, and if you I suppose look at the trajectory of music Western music history there there is arguably a gravitation towards um, timbre spectrum and possibly noise so my work too was also uh, in many ways reflecting this zeitgeist becoming more and more noisy I kind of hung out with the wrong musicians 
uh, and did some collaborations with um, Napalm Death, for example, the Japanese noise musician Mertzbo, I say wrong musicians, uh, and also this gave me a reputation of, I, I suppose, being a noise musician. Although it's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? Because for me, I wanted to make those sounds. Uh, I, noise for me is unwanted sound, and for me it was very much a choice to be creating music in this way. Uh, so whereas this term suits other people, I was less, less happy about it. So I was working with a type of material that was uh, mainly concerned with timbre, and I also wanted to, uh, again, find some kind of way of using my hands, thinking in terms of shapes, uh, and rejecting um, this notion of sitting in front of a computer. I was particularly influenced by this text here, um, The Joy of Noise by Hen Henry Cowell, uh, which talks about noise as a kind of healthy bacteria. And in many ways I, I considered that, this type of material in a similar way to Cowell. Also here, uh, this particular text helped me put flesh on some of the ideas that I was um, trying to um, grasp. This, this uh, very interesting book by David Sudno called Ways of the Hand, which did talk, well Sudno was a sociologist, but he, he gives a really fascinating account of how he learned the piano, for example, and it was all a question of shapes and patterns for him. Uh, and for me this, this, this resonated. and. Uh, at the time, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a kind of rejection of this in some ways, in terms of musical instrument, and a, a, the, f the kind of feeling that we were moving into a wireless uh, virtual world, you know, where you could wave your hands in the air and you could, you could perform some kind of futuristic instrument. And as Laurie Anderson said, there is not enough dirt in virtual reality. This was another thing that kind of uh, was playing on my mind. So dirty electronics, a word I used to describe my art practice, seemed to combine this getting your hands dirty approach and also working with noise. It seemed like a, ha a happy marriage of the two. And uh, having a music background, I suppose my first uh, explorations of this was through a notion of instrument and but I, I think with this particular talk I I want to try and put across that uh, my my journey has been through sound to get to some of these points this this idea of objecthood or materialism and, and how these things have influenced my work, but I've actually come th to this possibly from a s different direction or from a different uh, origin than someone like Tim, for example, who's kind of has similar ideas to mine. Uh, and so initially thinking in terms of instrument and how you might play, how you might play this instrument. And I think over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, this idea of me playing the instrument is something I have questioned time and time again. This shift away from the, s the subject, if you like, much more towards the object, where it's not a question of me playing the instrument, but me having perhaps more of a relationship with this object, which is quite a big step from this idea of a musician who sets out to play an instrument. And I, I would often make very, I, I call them simple, interfaces. Again, I use this word interface. Um, but again, my work became less interested with interface, because interface always suggests some kind of go-between. Interface is a word that has been thrown up by digital technology. Uh, we somehow have to translate a physical action into some binary code through an interface. I started thinking more in terms of uh, an object that was more holistic in terms of how I 
engaged with it and the sound that it made. Like many instruments, you, for example, you touch a guitar string, it's not, it is the interface, but it actually also vibrates. There is, there, the guitar doesn't have an interface in the same respect as a piece of digital technology. I didn't like the idea of interface. It annoyed me. There was something in between, some mumbo jumbo. Uh, you could go to a conference and people would talk about all the mumbo jumbo that went on in between the uh, the human being and the uh, the sound that you were hearing. So I spent a, a bit of time trying to, in many ways, uh, take on a more reductionist approach, where looking more directly at the, the very things that, that were making the sound. I was fascinated with technological artifacts as well. It's not, it's not just acoustic artifacts. And I sometimes ask, I think I ask myself, why, why, why electronic sound? Uh, why have I sp spent most of my life as, a, I suppose, an electronic musician or working in the field of electronic music? Uh, I don't really have an answer to that. I think the, the only answer I can possibly give is ultimately to try and make sense of it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I find myself within that milieu and instead of being interested in technology per se, I've become, I've become again more and more concerned with um, trying to consider, uh, again Tim mentioned this, this, this human aspect, it's about relationships with technology rather than the technology itself. Uh, so, uh, the big difference, I, I've often <coughs> find myself where, where I'm invited to talk about some of the things that I've made uh, and, and some of the things that I have made I, could, I suppose have been commercialised, for better or worse. But, but the, the, the irony of this is I've never considered, never, never considered myself an engineer. And this is, there's a very different, perhaps, ethos here, that some of the objects that I'm interested in are deliberately problematic. It's, again, because I'm interested in how I might engage with that object. So many of the artworks that I make or the performances uh, set up some kind of scenario where um, we, for, well, we could say things that are difficult to control, things that maybe are clumsy, things that break. For example, the, uh, the projector in this room and the PowerPoint, the black screen and the white screen. The, this, these kind of idiosyncrasies of something that often get ironed out in the process of design are things ultimately that I strive to exaggerate. But that's probably just being a musician or an artist, isn't it, in many respects. That's what many of us do in this room. So it's not necessarily about making things efficient. Uh, and uh, I've become more and more interested in these kind of extended processes and the, some of these... Uh, design questions, if you like, which has brought my work into a, a, a larger arena. So luckily these days I get to talk to as many um, new media students or art students as I do music students. For example, uh, here you go, I'll jump to this. This is a, a quite interested in motors, partly because uh, the motor is a very close relative of the loudspeaker, and despite all the high-tech uh, digital equipment that we operate and use, the loudspeaker hasn't changed that much really. It's still a magnet and a copper coil, and in many ways a motor is a kind of analogous to the to the loudspeaker. Uh, if you rotate a motor, it will produce a waveform. Um, and if you rotate a motor, it will also produce uh, electric current. So I first thought, ah, oh, it'd be great, just create some kind of instrument that, uh, or, or use a motor to generate a current to drive a, a synth or some kind of electronic sound circuit. But, but of course, it, it did occur to me that maybe I should just plug the motor 
directly into the mixing desk and see what comes out. So the, the, these sorts of kind of awkward uh, situations, uh, th these are things that excite me. Also, how might I play this motor? So this particular motor here that's taken from a, a printer has a pair of scissors attached to it. Uh, now, Lisa was talking about Heidegger and tool theory. And I could mention James Gibson and his idea of affordances. So, what do you mean? What do, what do I mean by affordance? So, a pair of scissors has a a hammer has a particular affordance, doesn't it? You want to pick it up and you want to smash something or hit something. Hit something. A pair of scissors has this kind of affordance, where you're going to bring your hand. It has a kind of latent action associated with it, or a chair. It also has some kind of affordance where you, it says sit on me, doesn't it? So that's going to force me to behave in this kind of manner. And so a motor, you could... I've put things down now. Yes, this is another motor from a printer. Uh, this one spins. So it, it's got a different type of affordance different way of a different it suggests a different interaction if you like by putting a pair of scissors on it suggests a different uh, something else shall we hear it <coughs> uh, i've i've i'm quite a big fan of free free jazz well maybe not the jazz but at least the improvised music. Some of the students I teach think I go home and listen to noise music all night, um, but I don't and I also don't particularly like listening to improvised music at home. I like to witness it, I like to experience it. I, I love to see the struggle that the, the music suggests that uh, things, we have to work hard to achieve something. And similarly with some of these instruments, they require some kind of effort or struggle. It's not necessarily obvious how this could make music or uh, how um, I might interact with it. But again, these, these scenarios, setting up this, these situations is something that I spend more and more time doing. That's the thing that, in terms of working, the kind of material nature, shall we say, of these objects sets the ball rolling. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, on it. I brought my own sound system with me. It's a bit quiet, I don't know why that is. Oh, come on. Oh well, sorry my very quiet but you can you can see how this particular instrument has a certain quality so it's a bit quiet that's something broken here can everybody hear that? just So, one's entire life focusing on sound, only to realise that uh, I, I think it's, this is a, most musicians and composers spend far too much time thinking about sound. This, uh, if you know, the the action is equally as important as the sound. You can take the sound of a of the voice and superimpose an envelope envelope 
of a snare drum over the voice and then the vo even though it's still the sound of the voice because the way in which it more, has a morpho morphology over time then ends up sounding like a snare drum. So actually the action and how a sound uh, changes over time has perceptually a really really big influence on how we perceive sound. So this, this has in many respects has no sound apart from the waveform that's being produced. When I say no sound, well, yes it does, it has a waveform, but it's the action which gives it its kind of meaning. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So, so perhaps that explains uh, some of these notions of deliberately creating challenging environments or situations where I'm trying to uh, engage with these objects. Some t again, a lot of large uh, ensemble pieces as well. Uh, I found, particularly in the world of electronic music, there was very much a focus on the individual, the solo DJ, uh, the, the laptop artist, um, often male as well. Uh, and wanting to move towards more of a, a kind of larger group uh, f form of electronic music. So most, I, I stopped recording. If you, if you Google John Richards, you'll probably find a CD of mine from the late 1990s, early 2000. Uh, I stopped composing. Uh, it's typical, bloody typical. I've got a friend now who's a Radio 3 producer. And they say, have you got any music for me? And I say, yeah, but you, you can't play it on your radio station. Partly because most of the performances were, I suppose, involved objects, things, people, rather than something that could be digitized. In, in many ways, uh, it was probably a good career move uh, because the following, that since that decision, you know, the last 20 years, music has got, become so cheap, it's so easy to copy, it's throwaway. Uh, and at least, I could say, at least I wasn't producing uh, a, a, a type of music that could be uh, copied or duplicated in that way. Yes, yeah, so lots of, lots of kind of event-based um, performances and sometimes in these performances there would be a, a kind of worshipping I suppose of the object and people would come together uh, I don't like the word workshop necessarily but it, people would often call them workshops but a kind of extended type of performance that involve making so <coughs> the, one obvious step that I took was into this, it, not only into the materials, but also into the process of um, making. And I suppose, if, again, if you Google John Richards, you'll see that most of my texts and most of my discourse is around this idea of, of the kind of DIY and making community, if we could call it that. The maker movement. There was a kind of zeitgeist at the turn of the millennium in terms of um, a kind of arts and craft revivalism, post-digital, people rejecting working with just digital technology, people wanting to do stuff with their hands, not just in the world of music, but in the world of visual arts, there, there were stitch and bitch, knitting came back in fashion, there was um, various publications, Make Magazine for example, uh, this type of practical work which many th people did think would be replaced by the digital um, revolution, if you like, came back in fashion. Uh, and, and I suppose the work I was involved in simply was part of that overall zeitgeist. So I too was working, I was making music in that kind of way building things with uh, large groups uh, and then I often thought that the building act 
acted as a kind of analysis. It sounds a bit dry, this, but the object is a way of studying the object. <coughs> so my work would happen over a day or two days, where sometimes I would stipulate what we would build. Not always, but give some kind of framework to the a structure, if you like, to the building. And that building would then inform the player, if you like, not only how to use it, but also create some kind of relationships, some kind of extended relationship between the, the maker, if you like, and then the, the resulting actions. Uh, so most of my practice uh, has happened, it happens in that kind of situation. So th this is uh, uh, in places, for example, like the ICA or other art galleries, music festivals. Sometimes people would video some of these things, uh, some recordings would be made, but I generally kept away from that. One thing that did result from this, however, was the artefact itself. Uh, and perhaps if I could uh, talk about that for uh, just a few more minutes. Yeah, so I obviously then ended up producing a range of artefacts from these extended events. Uh, sometimes they would be circuit boards, um, so I would design uh, some kind of, let's, what should we call it? It's, I was very struck by David Tudor who coined the term composing inside electronics. I really like that idea and you can, using this type of environment, this is called a breadboard, you can put components into this environment and then listen, use your ear in a kind of trial and error way to construct something that will behave in a certain way or make a sound in a certain way. And uh, I then started working with a lot of mat materials. I, I was fascinated by the, the objects themselves, the shapes, the patterns, the way in which they could look visually. Again, it's being drawn more and more into the kind of visual, or not only visual, but the way in which not not only the form, but also the function of these components. Uh, sometimes I would work in collaboration with other artists, um, visual artists, to create circuit boards which generated sound or music, depending on which way you looked at it. And they became, if you like, my, uh, my canon. They became my output. So instead of CDs or... Um, stuff written like a score, for example, possibly. Uh, ob these were objects. And within the object, you could argue it's is, is a compositional ethos within, within the object itself, which is a big difference from saying that the, these, these objects are instruments. Be because uh, as an instrument, you generally would want it to be kind of subservient to its user in many, many respects, although that's not, you might dispute that. Or, here, there is, a, it, there is a very very much more, I suppose, uh, this idea of this object as having a more compositional aesthetic, where, uh, where you can, in many ways, have some kind of active participation with that composition in a different way from something that's fixed, but it still remains, uh, it's, it, it still has its certain limitations. As a, as a composition. It, it's, so it's somewhere in between, I suppose, this idea of composition and musical instrument, if that makes sense. And I, I've done a number of these uh, uh, objects, some for record companies. Uh, I did a th I've done two of these with a record company called Mute Records. Let's see if I can... Let's just flick through some images very quickly. I've only got one minute. This is an instrument that you... It's like a yoke, very hard to play. You strap it across your... It's a lot, of e a lot of effort for just a tiny little sound. Uh, this idea of really long bow, bowing instruments. Yeah, often these are sorts of performance situations. I like um, uh, Robert Morris's idea. The, these, these are fascinating. You, can, you can't quite control the way in which your, your body on these um, very uh, wobbly in fact, this, this initially when it was shown at the Tate, 
they had to ban it because too many people had accidents. But I've done similar pieces to this, where actions are kind of forced on the performers, where you're, you're slightly out, kind of not in control necessarily of what you're doing. Um, some examples. Just, just things like put the instrument as far away as possible and then ask the performer to play it. I like that. I like that sort of... It changes your whole relationship with the instrument and the music as a result is very different. Or something deli deliberately impossible like lick this instrument and push it across the floor with your nose or so something like that. A little bit fluxus. It's too serious music technology. Way too serious. Mm -hmm. The impossible fleece, sheep fleece, electronic sound device. Um, rattling feathers. The, these were nice. The battery, uh, the, the battery holder is partic I'm particularly fond of this little innovation. So this rattles across the floor. And the idea was that it would drag also the performer across the floor. But the battery is a little bit heavy, so the dinky car provides a perfect vehicle to drag the battery also across the floor. A nice mixture of objects and uh, imagery involved in that. And also the feather, which vibrates, has some sort of erotic kind of quality about it. It's a little bit risque, possibly. Feather dances, etc. Uh, more recently, trying to break the kind of grid system of circuit board design, curvy shapes, wonk, hence, hence this title of my talk, trying to push the limits of the conventions of what we think of as a circuit board. Can I do something even more um, challenging with this? And also thinking about, because in electronics you simply, you, an, an engineer would make the shortest possible track from A to B. The longer the track, you possibly introduce noise, shall we say. So it's not very good design ethos, but thinking the opposite, making ridiculous s tracks on the circuit design to introduce maybe more noise or think about it in a different way. Think about it in terms of how it looks visually. Um, and you can look at some of these objects here. So this is my world. And I sometimes use the word post-digital. In fact, I think I used it once uh, on a paper that I wrote. Uh, in, I think early 2000, I wrote a paper called 32 Kilos, which is, com which is completely out of date now because you can't carry 32 kilos on a cheap airline. Uh, but it was a response to trying to perform electronic music in a digital world with lots of physical things. And uh, that, that paper got me in hot water in terms of talking about this discourse between post-digital and digital and analogue. So I've scratched the surface, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Good. <laughs> so I think we've got an impression of what you're up to with your students as well. <laughs> yes. Telling them to push objects across the floor like that. Yeah. Is that one of the modules you've on them? No, the, the, some of these... Uh, uh, yeah. That particular event was... It was called Ugly Weekender which was uh, an Arts Council event, event in Nottingham, but, uh, yeah. Good, very interesting, fascinating. So, um, any questions? <laughs> oh, yeah? Any Nicholas? Any? Okay. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> it's just a really simple question of, um, because you gave the demonstration of one at a time, this is sort of one sound. I wonder how much did they get a chance to chat to each other, whether they get new purpose, the instruments are really cycled at all, and can they sort of flare up and start to chat to each other? Um, uh, outside of somebody using them within a space, I wonder if they could sort of almost layer up like an organ. Sort of yes. Um, the, um, this particular instrument, let's have a look. <laughs> Um, lots of slides. Here we go. Yeah, this this one 
again, this is back to the, I the ICA event. This was a uh, design where you would also have the ability to daisy chain some of these circuits together so to build up a more complex interrelationship, not just with the performers but also the, the objects. The, I mean, the beauty of uh, a lot of these electronic instruments is that they have uh, often the ability to be modular. So you, you can combine them. In fact, um, uh, I've been w working on a set of instruments it's just, um, with a graphic designer called Jack Featherston. He normally designs t-shirts uh, for Warp Records, but uh, so we just built a collection of odd shapes. These can be combined in different ways. Uh, there's a never-ending possibility. In, in many ways, it scares me this because you can, uh, setting the limitations, the beauty of something physical that it does have its uh, lim limitation. And one thing which I didn't talk about so much there is al also I, I've started doing hybrids. So an instrument like this is part digital and part analog. It has a microprocessor in it. Uh, which can be programmed, uh, but then this, you know, this is soft, soft technology that doesn't have those kind of physical boundaries, so you can reprogram it. That's in many ways it goes against my ethos because it, it destroys this idea of limitation. It creates a very interesting scenario in terms of what you can produce through a kind of hybrid hybridity between an analog. Well, in this sense, it's analog control and uh, a, a digital. Sorry, analog sound, so all the sound is still produced using analog technology. But the actual control, so there's a, a sequencer, if you like, you can actually comp com compose quite a long composition if you wanted to. You can control that analog sound on this board using a microprocessor. So, so that's a, uh, again, there's no end to the possibility here. And, uh, so the danger, some people often ask me, why do I shun? Uh, the uh, there's a, a very big analog modular revival for synthesizers, and you can build up module after module after module after module, and I think people just collect it and they just don't stop. Uh, I've generally kept away from that, and I've just tried to work on. You know, this could exist in its own right. This is self-sufficient, self-supporting. Um, maybe you just need a pair of headphones or a small amplifier. Thanks for a great talk. Um, these are some really fascinating looking instruments and I like the, the picture of the t-shirts as well. I want to know uh, what, your, um, what your approach is to notation. Is notation now banned or are the instruments their own notation? Um, looking at that t-shirt just now, um, could you go back to that slide? I think the next one. Uh, I mean that kind of looks like a notation already mm. uh, for, for these instruments. Um, <coughs> I'm wondering if, if the Dirty Electronics Group uh, up in Leicester have tried to perform some some of the more graphic uh, works, uh, John Cage or Christine Wolf or something. Uh, but actually, from another point of view, of inventing the instrument to perform the piece, has that ever happened, or what's your take on that? That has happened a lot. Uh, so uh, we've had p uh, composers like Anna Meredith, um, Keith Rowe. Um, We've done a version of uh, a contact by Stockhausen. So a, no, a number of, there have been a number of um, Christian Wolf. We've done, yeah. Uh, so sometimes uh, people will approach me and say, "Here, here's a piece. Realise it in your way." So that's that has remained something like that I've done and I've enjoyed, and that that kind of collaborative nature uh, is something I'm very interested in. How do you? Where's the score? This is very interesting. I, or how do you document this or disseminate it? Uh, um, it becomes more like an extended documentation because you have the, the instrument itself. Uh, sometimes you have the computer code. Uh, you have video, of course. What, the definitive object. Uh, it becomes more of a challenge. Booklets, I've, I've produced booklets that go with an object. So in that booklet, you get a little bit of a, how you make the object. So it's, it's often a little, bit, a little bit like a cookbook in many ways. So this is how you make it. 
this is how you might um, present it. S uh, sometimes there's other ideas from other composers as well. This recent project, the one with the T-shirt, the uh, on this particular chip are, are interviews as well. So I, um, with Frieda Naik, who is a comp computational artist from Germany, one of the first, um, Mark Fell, another uh, electronic musician, actually Jamie Allen, who's an interaction designer, also very s looked at all the materials in this object, gold being one of them, and then did some kind of data mapping and tracked the, st the stocks and shares of that particular material over time, and then wrote a, a pattern that resides on this chip. So you can play his composition on this particular object. It's, it's coded onto this chip. And when you switch it on, um, it's, I, I decided not to use um, numerals, Roman numerals, but it's got um, uh, glyphs that um, represent the pattern or the composition. So on this object are a set of compositions. There's some bell ringing changes on here, which is kind of more process process driven. Uh, so then the discourse becomes, and, and the kind of score, if you like, becomes also multi-layered using a range of materials. Uh, and I think it will probably keep me preoccupied for the rest of my days, that one. <laughs> So if you put it in, if you, can you plug it into a PA system and then play the yes. use off it, that's how it operates. So you've yeah. got, just got an audio jack on it. Yeah, this, this, um, but you can, what's slightly, you can version it. So you can either use the same sequence or patterns with this object, or you can version it with this object. So that makes it a, a, quite a different proposition. It, it, you'll rec something that you could argue, even though we have a slightly different sound, do we have something fundamental about the pattern, about the sequence itself? Does that still reside in the, in the composition, even if we change the sound? And I think my point about the scissors, I, I think possibly I would argue that yes, that still should be considered as a composition, even though we may, in theory, change the, sa the, the sound of it. Relate to any question about the machines talking to each other, because actually, if you daisy chain two together, but then put another one on or change them over, then something different will happen. So it's yes. sort of modular, but also there's a degree of chance built into what might occur. Right. Yeah, or, or the m interpretation. I like to call it versioning. It's a different type of way of. Uh, appreciating sound and music, it's a, it's a much more, it suggests that you are, I mean, cause I, I, you might dispute this, cause, because listening isn't just passive, no, listening is also a very active activity, but this is, a, a, it's a, suggests something that's more actively engaging. You can't just sit back and necessarily listen. You can, but actually you can't. You have to engage with it in, in a kind of more active way, which, um, I, and I think maybe that also reflects a kind of zeitgeist. We live in an age of participation. One, if this is the kind of, speaking about post-digital, where the digital, uh, be one minute here, kind of influences the analog as well, because we can blog, we can tweet, we can be doing things, we can engage, I suppose, on a, in a kind of multifaceted way. This idea of constantly being engaged and constantly being active is also kind of being followed through with these objects too. You're, you're engaged yes. with them. Yes, because we, under, we can understand the analogue world differently because of the potential the digital media offers to sort of prise apart different aspects of yes. the elements of it. So it's not post-digital, but it's a sort of maturity of understanding the way technologies operate and how one technology might then give us a different route through to another. And again, this is something very much at the kind of my practice. There's a book by Andrew Hugel called The Digital Musician, and I was a case study in it. But at the time, I'd, I had completely rejected working with digital technology. So some people would ask, well, how on earth are you in that book? But it's all, all about the way which you conceive things and the conceptual nature of the digital mind, if you like. 
and I, I began to feel this from a, quite an early quite early on in terms of working with di digital technology is how then it informed me working with other things in my life that weren't necessarily digital. <laughs>